tell you, we have a little, actually, a clip, a rare clip. I haven't seen this, of Camille. She's been featured in a variety of documentaries over the years. One was called Glenda and Camille Do Downtown, hmm. which was a video collaboration with New York drag queen and producer Glenn Belverio. Glenda and Camille Do Downtown won first prize for the best short, short documentary. It's like a Janice Ian type documentary in the 1994 Chicago Underground Film Festival. So we thought we'd like to show you an even shorter clip of Glenda and Camille doing downtown with a scene of Camille and Glenda confronting anti-porn demonstrators in the village in New York City. Common scene here in New York. Let's take a look at it. Anti-art, anti-sex, anti-everything. You people can go to hell, okay? Camille Pollard is here you in your face. Why did you lose your job? In your Reach face. Your I, I, oh. Because I am like an in-your-face feminist, okay? All right? And I got in a fist fight, okay? <laughs> Uh, the, the feminism of the 21st century will be pro-art, pro-sex, pro-porn! I'm Bill Boggs in for Robin Leach tonight. We're joined by a person who enjoys deflating politically correct people. Camille Paglia has just written a new book called Vance and Trance, New Essays, which covers everything from her opinion on Woody Allen, Madonna, Barbara Streisand, to pornography, sexual harassment, and art. And it is a pleasure to have you with us. Well, Bill, I have to recall that it was you in 1991 who was my first TV mentor. That's and right. That's when you were very tall and blonde. I, I remember. know. I changed your image totally. I had just begun um, going on TV. I was like a wild animal, and you tamed me. So, Bill, I am a product of your imagination in certain ways. Camille, <laughs> if, if I have tamed you <laughs> in any way, I'd be very, very surprised. But thank you. I appreciate that. It's really That's when we met, and I've had a very warm feeling for you. Not like... Not like many of your critics, why do you provoke people? And I told people I'm interviewing you today, oh, I can't believe it, you're interviewing that person? Yeah. Hey, I like you. Mm -hmm. I think you got great thoughts, but why do you provoke people in the way well, you do? Well, every original thinker gets this kind of flack. In the beginning, I've only been on the scene for five years, but it has to be remembered, I'm a teacher of 24 years, all right? and, I, and, my, and my experience of, of dealing with ideas is very deep. People who badmouth me are just ignorant. I'm not responsible for their enlightenment. I've written three best-selling books. I've gone around the world. I'm the mo one of the most well-known women in the world right now in terms of the literary world. And so anyone who badmouths me, that's their problem. Think they're jealous to a certain extent? No, they're just ignorant. And I, 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 there's only so much you can do for people. I mean, if they want, if they will just open any of my books, they will see that, I, that my books bear no resemblance to the defamation that is continually heaped on me by the academic and literary establishment. Well, well let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Well, while somebody's watching now, it's a food network. They, yeah. They've missed these three books. They've not read the books. Mm -hmm. they, they haven't heard much. Name. Define yourself for someone who you, you'd like to meet You'd like them to meet you in a yeah. nice way. Well, I'm a 48-year-old I'm lesbian scholar, okay, who um, who was totally unknown until until. Wait a years second, ago. you're yeah. a scholar? I am a scholar. Oh. I have a PhD from Yale, all right, and I, in, you know, and I believe in learning. I believe in reform of education. I love popular culture. I'm a, you know, admirer of Madonna. It goes, it goes down the line, um, but I'm a. A product of the 60s generation, we we right Me you too. as well Me right, too, yeah. and I think the, the the effort of my career is to establish the um, vitality. Um, and originality of the 60s imagination. I think that the 60s have too bad a reputation these days. Well, you know, I read an interesting, the Playboy interview was very interesting. The, one, the Playboy that had Nancy Sinatra on the cover. Italian-American women ruled that issue. <laughs> he yes. certainly did. Yes. That the, I totally lost my train of thought. Well, you the read, last time that happened. what was it in the Playboy interview? There was something I said in it that, that was that, well, well, more I, outrageous no, than anything I, before? I, 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 re I read the whole, oh, I remember what yeah. it was. We were talking about 60s culture. Thank you. Yeah. And you, you really were looking forward to Bill Clinton coming in. You really thought that Bill Clinton was going to be able to, in his way, you know, redefine 60s values in the 90s. But instead, you say today he looks like a a, a salesman, I like know, a it's car sad. salesman. It you're really you're sad. sad about this. He came in for on, on a on a, pol a policy of change, and so I feel I'm a Clinton Democrat. I'm going to vote for him again. But I think that it's so sad that many of the great uh, reforms are being done now by the Republicans, which I, and I think that they're they're positive for the country to look at bureaucracy, to cut it down to size, um, to to re to really have a whole period of, of new ideas. It's very exciting. I'm really sorry that it's not my party, the Democratic Party, that's doing it. Not, and uh, that, that has been bounced back to Republicans. 
but yeah. I don't want to talk too much politics now because there's so many other things. I want to talk to you a little bit about the OJ case. Okay. We haven't discussed that too much here on, on Talking Food in mm -hmm. action in the past couple of days. What does the OJ case mean to you in terms of the power of women's, women's sexual power? Yeah. First of all, I'm a, I was a mad fan of OJ. I'm a great football fan. It is my only real religion, football. Um, but you I worship football? I adore it. I have learned so much about, about the world through football, uh, offensive and defensive strategies and so on. Oh, I adore it. I, that, that would be a program in itself, my love of football. Okay. Well, uh, now, the, th the thing is, I feel that, the, that the, um, there's too much of the usual feminist line on the OJ case, that, uh, that Nicole Simpson was a pure victim, poor dear, and so on. I, I am trying to empower women to realize the part that they play in long, complicated, ambivalent relationships. There were many, many times when uh, Nicole should have left and did not. All right? I think love I and passion are very, very complex things that feminist rhetoric um, is not sufficient for because it constantly posits man as the oppressor, woman as the victim. And what it's, I it's all polarized when it doesn't need to be polarized in the way it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's not black and white. That any woman who stays in a relationship past the first or second episode where she is struck is complicitous with that relationship. And I think that, that uh, Nicole bears her, I mean, she did not deserve OJ to be slaughtered, and, and if OJ did that, he deserves to be executed. It was a barbaric act, act, and it should be punished by civilization. But nevertheless, I think that too many women just go along to get along. They're addicted to, the, in this case, the money, the position, the glamour. When she, she, I mean, for heaven's sake, she hardly pressed charges against him after so many incidents that, w that went back to the first six months of their relationship. I want women to bear full responsibility for their part in every relationship. But, well, what does what does it mean about the power of women's sexual persona? The, the case. Yes, women. This is women must realize the degree to which men are obsessed with them. That women's sexual beauty is a power in and of itself. That here's what I'm saying in my work. Every man is born from a woman's body. Every man staggers out from the shadow of woman's power. And to go from boyhood to manhood is a very, very perilous journey that is marked by, by all kinds of bizarre rite de passage in uh, world culture where, where, where men are cut with knives, thrown to pits, put out with wild animals, and so on and so forth. I'm saying that man, okay, is a pitiable being. He staggers from control by his mother to Ooh. control by his wife. And, and, uh, and really wants the nurturing. The, the nature of heterosexuality is that the man wants to be nurtured yes. by a woman. It took me years to realize this. As a lesbian, if I had realized this, I would have had a much more successful dating life with men. Now, I have been with men. I'm attracted to men. But I, I never realized until I became, uh, uh, into my 30s, that all men want is attention and approval. That's all they want, okay? Attention, all right? And if I had known that, that men are not egomaniacs, men are not these tyrants, that is, that is a false bill of goods sold by feminism. It's an immature and adolescent point of view. And I, I realized that my very successful heterosexual women friends had liked men. That's the secret of a good dating life, if you like men. But you okay. didn't like men? I realized that I thought they were more powerful, powerful than they are. And when I resolved my problem with men, and you know how, I, as a teacher, when I got to age 35, I suddenly realized the young men in my classes, there was a misty look they were projecting toward me. I was the mother. I went, oh, men are frail, men are pitiable, men need help. But you say that the men, <laughs> the, the yes. real men, yes. the real men, like the men who fix cars, yes. for example, mm -hmm. they like you, yes. but the men at college are afraid of you. This no? is so true. I noticed when I had my job at Bennington College, it was Bennington where I was fired eventually. But for getting into the job. fight with students? Y yes. I went, I, I would go from the faculty meeting where the, where the academic wimps hated me, I would go to, to pick up my car being fixed, and the, and, the, and the real men, the mechanics, thought it was hilarious. Feisty little Professor Paul, isn't she cute? Real men <laughs> find me cute, okay? Wimps, castrates, okay, eunuchs who are everywhere in the New York literary establishment, okay? They hate me because I have more testosterone in this little finger than they do. Okay, I'm telling you right now, okay? And that is the problem, okay? That is the problem. Real men, soldiers, athletes, you know, doctors, Doctors, people who work in the physical world always right. like me. Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Hypothetically, if we could do a movie and we could cast you in as yourself, mm -hmm. who are some of the current leading men you would like to play opposite in scenes? And who are some of the current leading men you would immediately get fired and, and thrown off the, thrown off the well, set? Well, I like Sylvester Stallone, uh, simply because he and I are very parallel sensibilities. Rocky, in fact, the very first photo shoot I had for the cover story on me for New York Magazine, I posed in Rocky's spot in front of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, holding a sword, defending the classics, and so on. Have you um, met Sly? No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't, but I identified with Sly, him. He's Sly, if you're watching now, potential co-star. Okay, He's next. a smart man. Who He's else? Smart yeah, he man. is. He went to my high school. You know. Really? Lincoln, Lincoln High School, Northeast no. Philadelphia. Sly Stallone. You're kidding. Okay. 
it young. Absolutely not. You know, in Iraq, he always wears the black and gold colors. Yeah. Our high school colors. I didn't know that. That's true. Well, not a lot of people did. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Fact, I'm not sure he remembers having yeah. those shots of the head. What are some of the other uh, some of the other men you'd like to play opposite? And, or, or no, give me the the opposite of that. A man you think I couldn't stand being in a scene with this guy. Oh well, I mean, there's so many like wimpy guys. There's the wimpy guys. There's so many. I mean, well, Bruce Willis is, gets on my nerves. Uh, you know, and so. Even that shaved head and the machine gun and the tattoo yeah, and the beard. Yeah, I mean, no, there's just there's so many of them that right. are just. How about women? Oh, women. You're a lesbian, so obviously yes. you're, you're attracted to I women. I adore Sharon Stone. You do? I adore her. Sharon, Basic she's Instinct she's was nice. a great. Sharon, Sharon Stone's great. That Basic Instinct was a classic to me. The feminist and gay establishment picketed that movie. I thought it was a great demonstration of the power of woman. The way she turned the men to jelly in the interrogation scene. Okay, the way the way the, here are the men who are the the potentates to the police, you know, and so on. And she, they they just went whoa. The they were like this. shifted. Oh, she was fabulous. Oh, just like that. Smoking a cigarette, smoking a cigarette. But, fabulous. You know, but I was yeah. wondering, why don't we have the, the female stars of like in the past? Think Ava Gardner. Oh, Ava Gardner. Ava Gardner. <gasps> Ava Gardner. Rita Hayworth. Yes. Lana Turner. Lana Turner. Oh, Lana Turner. Grace Kelly. Yeah. I'm making you salivate yeah. here. Why don't yeah. we have parallel female beauty today? Okay, I have said about Hollywood that the pro problem is that people like Meryl Streep, whom I despise. I mean, I Why like, don't I, you like Meryl Streep? I, love, had, I, I loved like her early. Big like face, you said. Is, uh, what? Anyone. <laughs> what, what is she, it? She was wonderful early on. Silkwood, I thought she was very good in, but she is so full of herself. She's, she's just this wasp cut off at the neck. Here's the problem. These actresses, they have, a, they have a superiority complex. We're now professionals. We don't want to do that superficial glamour scene. Okay, excuse me. If you're a Hollywood star, you better do glamour. Then they complain, they kvetch. Oh, we don't get paid as much as, as Schwarzenegger and so on. Why? Because the men have never given up their masculine glamour. There's a direct line between Clark Gable and Gary Cooper and Stallone, okay? Right. Whereas the women, oh no, I'm going to, uh, Streep, I'm going to be at my house in Connecticut being very superior. Excuse me, Sharon Stone knows how to get out of a limousine at the Oscars, okay? All right? She knows how to, like, be, how to be charismatic, all right? And that is the point. The Hollywood is, because ho the Hollywood actresses have renounced their glamour, it has migrated to the supermodels. The supermodels are now world famous because they it's are supermodels the, the now. supermodels right. are the heirs of the right. great Hollywood era. Is it true that you once uh, actually stalked, or not stalked, or followed Catherine Deneuve around the department it's, store? It's too true. It's too true. You like yes. Catherine Deneuve? I ran smack into her in front of Saks Fifth Avenue in 1968, and I followed her into the glove department, and I asked for her autograph. Now, I would slap anyone who asked me for my autograph in the glove department of Saks. And, you, <laughs> and you saved 599 pictures of Elizabeth Taylor. I was an obsessive compulsive. This is why I, I understand stalking behavior, why I'm a very good analyst of, of uh, stalking and raping and all kinds of criminal behavior, because that was, I had such an unsatisfactory sex life until very recently. I have just celebrated my two-year anniversary. With Congratulations. That's Alison good. Maddox. Sex my is good in your artist. life now? Yes. Uh, we have been together two years now. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have a very, yeah, but anyway, I'm in my 40s. There was no excuse for the misery, the misery of my life until recently. That's good, though. Yes, it's good. The best is yet to come. It's, it is true. I'm, I'm, I have a, uh, yes, I have a very happy midlife. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take a break right now, and uh, maybe we can hold hands for a while. Yeah, I, fi I find you very attractive. You do. That is? On set or off set? Both. All right. We'll be back right after this. Well, we have returned with Camille Paglia. This is her book, Vamps and Tramps. It's a very nice book. By the way, if you'd like to have the complete library, this is the uh, other one, uh, Sex, Art, and American Culture. And the first one that we worked on together is Sexual Persona. And we have a phone call. By the way, our phone number is 212-398-2300. And Dan from beautiful Pompano Lakes, New Jersey, on the line right now. Dan, fire away. Uh, yes. How are you doing, Bill? Fine. Thank uh, you. Camille, how are you? I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, what is your opinion about uh, Oprah Winfrey and her show, and do you feel it's sexist towards men? Uh, Oprah Winfrey and her... Television show? Her, well, Oprah Winfrey in general, I think, has been very revolutionary in terms of just the presence of African-American culture and style. I think that her audiences alone, so many African-American women of every social class have, um, have been in her audiences. I'm a great watcher of talk shows. I've learned an enormous amount over 20 years. I've paid much more attention to them, uh, not only to the guests, but to the audiences and how they have changed than I do to feminist ideology. Now, your question was her attitudes toward... So if it's, you think it's sexist towards men. Her head toward men. Exactly. Well, um, sometimes Oprah drifts a little bit toward the PC line. I think that 
because of her own experiences of, uh, of uh, childhood sexual abuse and so on, occasionally she does have a, just a slight edge of may maybe a male bashing quality. But I think recently she really is trying to evolve away from 1970s, 80s feminism toward a more, uh, you know, a new, more expansive um, 21st century feminism that embraces men. All right, good. Let me ask you this. So what yeah. do you say that people say, oh, these daytime talk shows are like freak shows. Oh. It's a parade of people coming on there, dredging up these weird problems about their lives they can't stand anymore, and they're playing tricks on them. They're going out and shooting each other. Mm -hmm. It's just going too far. How do you react to that? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of arrogant elitism on the part of the, of the Northeastern uh, media establishment in, like, dismissing, oh, these people, uh, who are these people? These are the people of America. It's America. These are the working class people. Their interests are there. Millions of people watch those shows. How dare these people, uh, media analysts sitting in Washington or, or New York, try to preach, okay? Uh, now, now, it's true, um, there have been excesses. For example, the Jenny Jones case, or I thought there was a very good case of producers with their, with their elitist PC agenda saying, hey, it'll be fun, won't it? Bringing a guy on and having another guy have well, a crush a, on him. That has evolved into a very common ploy yeah. to really trick and set up things. I mean, that's yeah. not not new in 1995. Yeah. That's been a daytime talk show gimmick for a long time. Yeah, I don't like that. I mean, I do think that the great period of the talk shows, it really was the 70s and early 80s. I mean, the early Donahue, you could not miss it. Good show. You should not have yeah. missed it. And there's so many ways that those talk shows have liberalized American opinion toward gay issues, toward transsexuals, yeah. transvestites. In so many ways, they've been very important. But I, I enjoy the shows. I constantly monitor them. I, but I, I don't like tricks. I think that, that that's oh, a You don't like tricks. Yeah. We have Joe. Maybe he's one of the typical people you're talking about from Eaton, Pennsylvania. My home state. On the line right now. Go ahead, Joe. Um, yeah, I was a little bit surprised at the comments about Nicole Simpson as victim. Um, it seems to me that um, your guests should have a little more social responsibility here and understand that the courts of the state of California forced her to have a continuing relationship with O.J. Simpson mm -hmm. because they had children. Mm -hmm. So this notion that she just hung around and, and just couldn't get away from him the courts force them to be together. All right. That's an interesting point. Let's find out what you say about well, it. Well, the caller has a very interesting point to make there. However, I'm talking about what I know from, from reading about and studying the case. In point of fact, these two people were locked together, and there was an awful lot of push-pull and, in fact, abuse on both sides. I mean, there were, there were all kinds of stories that have been corroborated of, um, of Nicole pulling up next to O.J. on Rodeo Drive, a very exclusive street in Los Angeles, in, in her car, screaming at him on the street, screaming and yelling because he's with a woman and so on. I'm telling you, um, this was a kind of um, S&M theater going on between the two of them. I'm sick and tired of men being blamed for long-term relationships of 20 years in this case where the woman bore equal responsibility for continuing. She went back again and again to OJ last year when he had already gone on to others and she brought him back into the relationship. Now, I don't excuse OJ. Again, he should be executed if he committed those crimes. But I'm tired of painting Nicole as an angel. All right. Let, let's talk about something that uh Senator Dole talked about last week, you know, when he painted uh, aspects of uh, American television, the music business, and, and, mm -hmm. and movies as being deplorable and, 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 and talked about real vulgarity in it. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, the New York Times had an interesting question about Time Warner, which publishes the gangster rap, which talks about the mutilization of women and, and shooting cops and so forth. They said, and I'm curious your answer to this question, should Time Warner sever its ties to incendiary rap performers and risk a backlash in the creative community, or should they hang tough and become Exhibit A in a Republican crusade against the erosion of traditional values in society? What do you think about that question posed by the time? Well, I have to say that popular culture of the 20th century is to me a pagan phenomenon. And for me, <laughs> in, in, in my books, my three books, I have I said that paganism is all about sex and violence, and that Judeo-Christianity is never has never been honest about these principles. So what my interpretation of, of contemporary culture is that what we see, the sex and the violence of movies and rock music and, and television and so on, they're a kind of compensation for the great omissions in our official religious system. So 
No, wait, run that by me. Just right. elaborate, right. if you will. What I'm saying is that sex and violence are, in fact, the principles of nature, Mother Nature. Darwin saw them there, okay? Mm -hmm. Freud saw them, the Marquis de Sade, or Nietzsche, the great philosopher of the 19th century. And I think that there is a... I, I, what I don't like is this idea that somehow um, there's this media establishment which is forcing in, uh, these issues on the public and corrupting them. What I'm saying is those issues are, have not been invented by Hollywood. They're in the human soul. The human soul itself is full of that evil. Okay? We have to be able to confront that and deal with it. If we apply uh, Dole's principles, we would have to eliminate Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex, which is all about incest and, and, and patricide okay, from our, in, our cultural agenda. We'd have to eliminate Hamlet, which, which, in which there are ten corpses strewn on the stage at the end, and so on. All great literature has, in fact, dealt with these questions. Of course, Dole, though, wasn't calling for censorship as much as he was calling for personal responsibility on the part of executives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that, that that's, a, that's a very good uh, step forward. I think that we should... It, I mean, my feeling is that um, there's been a decline in the aesthetic, aesthetic standards, okay, of Hollywood movie making. It is due to... And that's not due to it. It's due to, Hol to, to, to the Hollywood system falling because of the invention of television in the 1950s, right? Television. No, people don't go out of the home anymore unless you are teenagers. Drawn out of the home. Teenagers and, and people on dates go to the movies. As a consequence, the quality of films has fallen, right? That the Hollywood is simply responding to the market. Very quickly, yeah. because we're going to take a break here. What, what do you think the negative, the effect of all this stuff is on those teenagers when yes. they're watching it in a movie? It is utterly ridiculous to say that violence in the media causes violence in the streets. That is simply not true. It, I mean, anyone who claims that is stupid. However, I think that the children are jaded. and It removes their imagination from them. I think, I think it brutalizes the imagination. Yeah, we're, we're, we're both old enough to remember a little bit about radio, which is mm -hmm. really was wonderful mm -hmm. for the imagination. We'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue with Camille right after this. Bill Box here in for Robin Leach tonight. In the next segment, Camille is going into the kitchen to cook with Kate. We've got somebody on the phone, Lori from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Go ahead, Lori, you're on the line. Hi, I was listening earlier and I was very struck by the comment about how certain women are somewhat complicitous in their staying in the relationships, abusive relationships. And I'm wondering on what level you see that. Um, is it on a more psychological or sociological level? Well, I think many women are afraid to be alone. And I, as a teacher, am trying to tell women that there's no reason to stay in a relationship where you are being brutalized and uh, being subordinated. Uh, but beyond that, I do think that there's a kind of addiction, uh, that, that, the, that the batterer is, in point of fact, an infantile personality who's fixated on the mother imago, the mother image in the woman. And that what I have noticed, and again, I'm, I'm observing as a teacher in my own students and so on, that then point of fact, often the women keep on forgiving. They keep on forgiving because they love the point where the man apologizes. The man becomes totally, uh, he just, he weeps, I'll never do it again. They have great sex after that and so on. And I, so I think there is a weird mother-son pattern in the batterer, uh, and battery relationships. Again, I think the feminist dichotomy of oppressor and victim is completely wrong and does not help women to understand their weird kind of, they have kind of maternalism toward their own victimizer. Hmm. You know, you, you, I read an interesting thing about you. You said you wouldn't be as explicitly frank about your sex life mm -hmm. if your father were alive yeah. today. Mm -hmm. Italian culture is very respect oriented, like Chinese culture. And my father um, came out of a working class background. He was the only um, one of 10 children to go on to college on the GI Bill and so on. He was a professor at a Jesuit school and so on. And I don't, I don't believe in, in terms of outing and so on, I don't believe in just embarrassing your family needlessly. And so um, he died, you know, five years ago from uh, cancer and so on. I mean, I was so, a little bit over it, but it really, after he was, uh, he passed, I, I felt that, um, then I had felt I had a, a greater obligation. But it doesn't embarrass you with your mother. Well, um, not so much, I don't think, because my mother was not part of, you know, like a Jesuit college faculty mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But my, my father made me. My father taught me to be an independent thinker from my earliest years. I, I, my father had very advanced ideas for an Italian-American father. And it was only, our conflicts only arose when I, I, I got to the age of 10, let's say, and then my ideas uh, differed from his, okay? It, you know, 
For, to, for someone watching now who's a parent and, and they're gleaning onto that line, what's one or two pieces of advice to raise a child to be an independent thinker? I think that we have underestimated the importance of fathers. I think that uh, so many powerful women have come from powerful father figures within the family. Um, there's no doubt. I think that, 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 your, uh, that your relationship to your mother is almost irrational. You came out of her body. But that the father represents a certain something external. The father is something very kind of taunting and, and testing and, and, and he, my father taught me how to fight, you know, to, to put up my fist and fight like a, like a, a boy, be able to fight my, defend myself on the street. Uh, he taught my, to me to express my opinion, to go against the grain, to go against the crowd and so on and so forth. I think that my mother would have preferred that I, that, um, that I would be a more conventional yeah. uh, woman that, that, you know, that, uh, you know, my, and so, and so there, 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 you know, so I got really both messages. I'm what do you say to the person who's watching right now say, oh, oh, your father turned you into a lesbian? The person well, who's heard that, oh, he made her fight, made her aggressive, and she's a lesbian today, and that's the reason. I, there's no doubt that my, my experience is that of 50s parents with 60s children. Okay, so my conflicts with my parents were shared by an entire generation, I think. And, and there's no doubt I was, a, I was the proto-feminist of my generation. Long Before Gloria Steinem ever became a feminist, I was out there. People remember from the early 1960s. I was unlike any girl that anyone saw in upstate New York. I was out there fighting with boys, and, and I was determined to show what women could do. I what, were you there, what were you trying to prove? I wanted to show that women are the equal of men, um, but not not that men are bad, not that men are are, are, are weak and, and tyrants and so on, but that women could achieve at the same level of as men, and that is that is still the uh, principle of my feminism. I am an equal opportunity feminist. I believe that I do not believe in special protections for women, and that is where I have about why my positions are so controversial, and uh, and why I, my name is anathema to most of the feminist establishment because they are male bashers and they believe that that men have oppressed women through history and that we have to protect women against the brutality of men. And I see women as having all the power, all the sexual and emotional power in the world. But you say, you say the, the feminists, traditional feminists today in 1995 have to stop bashing males. Yes, but there is Period. a reform movement in feminism. Christina Hoff Summers, Katie Royfe, and so on. And it's very, very vigorous. When I came on the scene five years ago, I was abused and defamed. I, was, I, I needed security guards to go to campuses. Now today, my ideas are everywhere today. Okay, we have uh, Ian uh, in uh, uh, Bricktown. Where is it? Bricktown, New Jersey? Go ahead. Yeah. You're on the line, Ian. Yes, Speak Meryl. right up. Uh, first off, Meryl, Meryl Streep is not a wasp. And also, I wanted to, she's Jewish. Um, you, there was an article in the New York Times book review written by Gay Talese on the lack of Italian novelists, and I wanted you to comment on that. Ah, the, the lack of Italian novelists. Gay Talese, who is a very prominent um, yeah. uh, novelist and journalist. Um, well, uh, he was talking about the fact that there have been so many Jewish writers uh, that Jewish tradition is book-oriented. It goes back thousands of years. Uh, the study of Torah, the study of Talmud, the sacred text, and so on. Italian culture, in contrast, it seems to me, is very visual. It's based on it's based on uh, images and also on music. That these are what we, what Italians really have given in the last several hundreds of years. This is why I have such a rapport with Madonna because I think that Madonna speaks uh, through visual or or even dance imagery. Yeah, and so uh, Gaetalese wrote to me when I first came on the scene and said how rare it is that Italian Americans have ma have made any kind of inroad into the literary establishment. I'm one of the first. Okay. Um, and um, you know, and I've tried. I, I'm very, very ethnic. I, this is why I'm not popular with the with the Ivy League, even though I got my PhD there, because I, I am an un uncompromising ethnic, and so I represent something new. I'm sick and tired, okay, of all other minorities being privileged, okay, Hispanic and Black and everyone else. Excuse me, Italian Americans deserve some recognition. My mother was born there. All four of my grandparents were born in Italy. All right, Ian. Thanks. We just have a minute left, and in the next segment, you're going to go over and uh, cook with. with Kate, so yeah. take a minute to tell us what was the kitchen like in, in this ethnic house where you grew up? What the was it, uh, your love of food? The kitchen is that was a center of the home. The, the, the kitchen was the, the, the shrine, okay, of one's life. Everything oriented around food and cooking. Um, I am I am obsessed with food. My feminism is a pro food, pro sex, pro art, pro beauty, <laughs> pro pleasure. <laughs> Okay, system, all right? And I feel, I, I hate the anorexia and bulimia obsession of current feminism. What turns you on about food? What can't you control?
when it's in front of you. I, I am visually stimulated. I am sensorily stimulated by food. I dream about it. I think about it. Well, I what do you about dream about? What kind of food do you dream about? I talk about it. I think about it constantly. I, I, I love to. This is why I have a rapport with African American working class culture because they love finger food too. They love ribs and chicken and they love to get in it and, they, and so on. And I, and I think that we have re there's something really wrong with our culture. Okay, the way uh, people used to congregate in, in the kitchen. And this is true for Jewish homes, Greek homes. Well, people still congregate in the kitchen. Uh, not, not, not in your not in your wasp yuppie home. Not with like 50 people in the kitchen with the windows steamed from the pasta cooking all day long. No. Uh, okay. Well, look. What, what are you going to make for us tonight? Are you going to get over with make a, a, yes. a, a, something you invented? I invented this kind of quick, I call it a quick Italian bouillabaisse. All right. We'll do that with Kate right after this. So stay with us here on Robin Leach's Talking Food. We'll be right back live. Everybody, welcome back to Talking Food. I'm Kate Connolly, and joining me tonight in the kitchen, Camille Paglia, and she's going to make, she's going to show us how to make her Italian blue base. Let's take a look at it. So beautiful. Mm. And it's easy and quick, I guess, huh? Yeah. And you yeah. invented it. I invented it as a kind of orgy. When one is feeling down, uh -huh. okay, one just goes to the, to the seafood store and buys mm -hmm. this enormous amount of fish, and then and then you have all this tactile thing. You're washing, you're brushing it, and so on. And then you have this wonderful steaming pot, and then you just you hang over and eat it, eat it, eat it. It's so restorative. It's so delicious. All right. Well, you go, girl, as they say. How do we start? Well, first of all, you have to put a little bit of olive oil in okay. it. Okay. And okay. we have a nice warm pot. Do you want it, like, medium? Heat yes, good. you have to be very careful. All right, all right. You, you want you want to heat up your olive oil, mm -hmm. but you but the point is you you don't want to burn your garlic. That is right. so crucial. Okay, mm -hmm. garlic must be just it must it must never be browned or Looks like burned, all right, because it becomes bitter. All right. Now yeah. the garlic mm -hmm. is for people who you decide how much you want depending on your social enough? obligations. Right. Okay? Exactly. If you have nothing the next day, now you see almost immediately it's turning brown. We must immediately put the sauce in. Okay. okay. The sauce. Which yes. One? Sauce this and one? water. Yes. This one. Okay. It only immediately. Whoa, whoa. That was right. hot. Yes, and with the water. Uh-huh. Yes, I think that pot was a bit hotter than we would have liked. Okay, there we go. All right. There we yes. go. And we're then, back. Then you add your spices, mm -hmm. okay? Now you see that garlic, uh, that garlic turned brown almost immediately. Almost right away. Right. Ga garlic becomes bitter when it's black, okay? Well, that, that is the number one rule of Italian cooking, okay, that people okay. don't realize. Now we want the spices. Okay, okay so great. I think we can put this pot back on, all right? All, all right. All these spices. Now, one of the major, major spices for my cuisine, my mother was born mm -hmm. about an hour south of Rome, and we, we need rosemary. That is one of, one of the crucial um, spices right. in my region's cooking. A rosemary gives an extraordinary kind of a savor mm -hmm. to, um, to to any kind of pasta. So even if I'm making like I, I, I even the bottled Italian sauce that mm -hmm. I might be using, I always still add rosemary to it. Okay, mm -hmm. it, it gives a particular kind of regional flavor, right? and uh, you will discover very aromatic flavor. Right. Now one one just lets this um, simmer a bit, letting the the, the uh, spices work through the sauce mm -hmm. um, as much as five minutes, right. and then uh, you just add all of your seafood. Okay. Now, now what we have here is a selection of very very get this small, very tiny. Tiny little neck clams. Yep. There's some mussels, mm -hmm. some shrimps in the shell because the, the shells give a one give into give into the sauce. There's all kinds of, of all the kinds flavor of, and everything. There are that things you want. inside the shell, okay, mm -hmm. that, that that give a flavor to the sauce. Right. It's really quite unique. So you yes. want to cook with it, all right? Mm -hmm. So we would just add it all. This is a bigger all piece than I would use. I would use. You want to cut in half? Yeah, you even a third of that. A third okay. of it, okay. You about want, you're taking a, a, a firm, that's perfect. Okay, great. A firm fleshed fish. Okay. And l you let it disintegrate, actually, in the sauce. Into okay? the sauce. Yes, you let, you let it shred, okay? Mm -hmm. So just throw everything so in there. Throw it all throw everything all right, in. Throw everything in. And then we want, and then, um, we want it to um, return to the boil. Okay. Now okay. watch out, I don't want to splash right. yes. this sauce. Uh -huh. Okay. Where did you start? Did you always have you always cooked? No, I don't cook that much. Uh -huh. But um, my my you know every Italian talks about uh, you know his or her mother's sauce. Right. My mother has a great sauce. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And they, we do not use seafood in our cuisine because we are inland people. Right. But I have a great love of seafood. I think my father's side was from inland from Naples. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. that's what is an atavistic thing about the sea from down right. there. Right. All right. Now we want we want to, to quickly cover this and make it return to the boil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's what you you need to do. I don't mm -hmm. know, I'm not sure how to adjust this here. Here, you want to turn it yeah, up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, turn, turn it to the boil. Okay. And the moment it returns to the boil, then you um, you let it go down to a simmer again, leaving uh -huh. it for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And, all right, and that's done? all. 
Then you open after 10 minutes, making sure that all your shells are open. Do you mm -hmm. want to discard anything that's not open? Right. And then you serve this magnificent platter mm -hmm. with a, a fresh green salad and, and a nice loaf of Italian bread and some red wine, and it is divoon. And it's easy. Easy. And it's quick. Quick and savory. How's this looking? Now, we have just a few minutes we while we wait for that to cook, and I want to ask you, why do you think we have so many problems with eating, with food? Mm -hmm. why, do, why do Americans have so much problem with food? There's a major crisis in the white middle class female sex role. Mm -hmm. Now, working class women, African American or, or, or a Latina or Italian, they don't have this problem, right? right? Anorexia and bulimia are indeed everywhere. They are epidemics on the, on the elite Ivy League campuses. Mm -hmm. but there's nothing in our culture to tell women how to be wives and mothers. Okay, we are yeah. now all pushing our young women into being future leaders. My culture, the Latin culture, the Mediterranean cultures, mm -hmm. where there's still a sense of the mystique and the power of women. So even women in like Spain or France or Brazil who are executives um, who, are, who are exerting social power still the way they can dress they're glamorous they're sexy because in Latin cultures you can be smart and you can be sexy not in Anglo-American Puritan culture mm -hmm. you have to be smart or sexy right. so, so we, there's, I mean I, there's, again you can go through Yale and Harvard there's not one moment when those colleges tell you how to be a mother mm -hmm. or tell you anything about the processes within your own body I dedicated my first book sexual personality to my grandmothers right mm -hmm. they were the most powerful and majestic women I have known in my life okay mm -hmm. and they ruled in the kitchen mm -hmm. they ruled right and so I love the Food Network I think it's, we're returning American culture to the sensory the tactile back to the pleasure principle again I feel that food and sex and pleasure are all interrelated yeah, yeah, I think you're right, don't you, John? Like what yeah. she said. Right, yeah. <laughs> and if you want a copy of what she said, you can send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to Camille Paglia's Bouillabaisse, recipe number 500 at Talking Food, Post Office Box 5458, New York, New York, 10185. And we're going to dish up the Bouillabaisse, and we're going to try it when we come back. So don't go away, because we have lots more. Hey, this bouillabaisse mm. is really good, Camille. Mm. What do you think, Ron? Mm. It's mm. unbelievable. Yeah. Oh. And it's fast. Yeah. I always think that a dish that takes easy. a long time. And you gotta love things you can make in one pot. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No fuss, no bother. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it fills the kitchen with a beautiful smell and yeah. You know. Yeah, but you can't get that out of a microwave. Now you were yeah. talking about your grandmother before. She had a yeah. special uh, method of cooking snails, yes. I believe. What mm -hmm. was that? Well, she would bring the snails, leave them in the kitchen sink, and then the next morning you'd know the snails that were alive were on the ceiling and the wall. <laughs> and the ones that were still in the sink were dead, throw them out. Get out of then here. we would she'd cook them in Italian sauce, okay? Uh, with, like, with, like, so the ones on the wall. In the yeah, ceiling. She got them down. <laughs> the there would be tomato and a lot of rosemary, and then you'd use hat pins to pull them out. Okay, one of my early, we call them chamots. One of my oh. earliest memories is taking out the snail with hat pins. Okay, That's like a little that. look because that yeah. boy, it's tough to get a child these days. Would your eight-year-old eat a snail? And no, because he had a pet snail. Oh yeah. So oh, well, he wouldn't, he, you know, Like Junior. you little Ralph. Yeah, yeah. No, right. You no. want to do that? And no. you also had, a, your, your family was into, you had lambs? Yeah, my grandfather would, chickens my, my grandfather would go up and buy a lamb. Actually, we had a lamb about back, but he would buy a lamb, slaughter it in the backyard, and, and then cut it up and, and grill it in, in little pieces like a sh like shish kebab mm -hmm. over the open fire. And it was it was like, whenever I read in Homer's Iliad about, about the warriors cutting up, you know. Right, right, right. It right. was mm -hmm. so delicious. And he would leave a lot of fat on it. And so uh -huh. it was so rich, so delicious, mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful and then mm. they, they had a they had a garden a bag they had animals and this was in a town upstate new york right. my other grandmother had chickens and eggs and so on so great yeah and, so yeah. you really you really like the natch the national farm the food yeah food is the center of of, of italian culture it's food and family the hearth mm -hmm. and certain ways that i think we're coming back to and i think the food network is certainly a symptomatic of a cultural change back to looking at quality of life in the home again yeah you know we're talking about uh, italians and their sauces i always like how it, uh, every italian man says i I make the best marinara right, sauce. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I make. Yeah. In That's your right. house, how was your dad's marinara? Well, everyone was different. I, I preferred my mother's to my grandmother's, let's say. Uh -huh. My mother always put pork. She always, uh, hmm. still to this day, mm -hmm. puts pork ribs in it and lets it simmer the entire oh, day long. And, th and that adds a wonderful quality yeah. to the sauce. Well, Camille Paglia, this wow. has been a lovely evening. And mm -hmm. the book, again, the most recent is Vance and France. Kate? A pleasure, as nice always. To see you, as Tomorrow always. night, Robin is guest is Diet Queen Nikki Haskell. So that's it for tonight. We wish you. So let's eat now before she gets here. Now, that's right with those star caps. <laughs> Robin will see you tomorrow.
So what does a wonderful Hall of Fame broadcaster, Bob Costas, have to say after reading Spike Unleashed? Well, old dog, not really. New tricks, plenty. Turns out Spike has more to say and more encounters with the virtuous and villainous figures of our time than any other person, let alone canine, I know. Thank you very much, Bob Costas, for liking Spike Unleashed. Order Spike Unleashed today. It's a roller coaster ride of comical suspense. Orderspike.com takes you right to the Amazon order page. That's www.orderspike.com.